Good luck. <laughs> okay, so gaming in the golden age. Um, I'm going to um, maybe put a little focus on uh, what the sort of purpose of this talk is, is to maybe talk more about like the human brain as the platform for gaming rather than the sort of various uh, awesome platforms we have out there. Of course, there will be a bit of platform talk in this. Uh, but uh, the focus is a little bit of sort of what's happening on the inside when we play games. And I'm obviously going to use EM Online uh, a lot because that's the game I know the best. Uh, just a little bit about me and CCP. Uh, CCP is funded in 1997 in Iceland. We have about 550 people worldwide. Uh, we have offices in Reykjavik, Shanghai, San Francisco, Atlanta, Newcastle, and New York. Uh, we have two games uh, which are out there, even Dust, and two games... Uh, in development. So um, Iceland is a little bit of a character in the story of EM Online and CCP. Uh, you might know Iceland for its uh, unpronounceable volcanoes. Um, uh, we had a bit of a thing going on uh, at one point where Eyjafjalla Jökull, that's how you say it, um, stopped air traffic. Um, and more sort of recently, Iceland has become world renowned for. Uh, various sort of, what would you say, economical experiments. Um, we have had, uh, we have the world record in having the biggest banks collapse the most and then bounce back the most. And, and um, it has become a little bit of a, a sort of an experimental economy of sorts. And it's a little interesting to sit in the sort of middle of the, of the micro bathtub that a 300,000 person economy is and sort of what's, well, how the underpinnings crumble apart. And when you sort of see that the emperor has no clothes, you start to understand what is money, what's a banking system, uh, what is uh, central banks, what are governments. And you quickly realize this is just a great example of very poor game design. And, uh, <laughs> and then on the other hand, we look at our, our economy on the other side, which is actually now twice the size. And we sort of look at, OK, how can we learn from this one? to bring good things over to this one. Um, and that is what we've been doing for, <clears throat> well, since uh, 1997. Uh, we've been sort of trying to come up with ways to build a very large uh, sandbox for people to do amazing things in and, uh, and create this sort of environment where people get to experiment, try new things, break things, and uh, figure out something that we never thought about in the first place. That has been the story of EVE so far. Uh, and I believe that is really the reason why EVE uh, has been growing for a decade. And hopefully, if we don't screw it up, continues to grow for another decade and then beyond. Uh, of course, uh, EVE has a bit of a reputation in the industry uh, for being not the, maybe the most casual game in the world. And here is a sort of artist interpretation of the uncasualness of EVE. And, um, uh, we have sort of made attempts to reduce uh, the learning cliff, um, and we have not made a lot of progress with it. So now lately we have sort of more gone into this way of adding new product experiences that connect into the uh, sandbox economy that is even online. Uh, we released Dust last year on the PlayStation 3, which is a first-person shooter that you can interrupt with Eve, uh, and then. Uh, this morning, we kind of confirmed the obvious that uh, we're working with uh, Oculus to bring uh, Valkyrie a new sort of game experience in the EVE universe, where we have sort of brought about a much faster pace, easier to access sort of pulse pounding experience with spaceships that eventually will sort of follow the trend of, of dust uh, to make sort of these interconnected experiences. Here's a, a sort of a picture that shows basically a spaceship in EVE Online firing a laser that lands on the ground on the PlayStation 3 and kills somebody over there, which is kind of cool when you, when you see it. A PC game basically interacting with an entirely different console game, and it all sort of goes through this infrastructure that we built up. This has gone into uh, close to a million people sort of participating in this Grand Tio Space Opera, and uh, it has made us think a little bit about what is really happening 
why is this sort of continuing to gather energy, emotion, and all this endless amount of drama that uh, now gets to be covered in, in world media like a, like a war in the revolt. And it's made us uh, basically write this down. This is something we wrote down in 2008. Then we were working a lot on sort of the company in terms of what are our values, what is our core purpose, and those kind of things. Uh, and we wrote this, the core purpose of CCP is to create virtual worlds more meaningful than real life. And uh, this, of course, sounds batshit crazy. And um, it's been a topic of very robust discussion inside the company even. What does it really mean? What is more meaningful? Isn't it just as meaningful? What is real life? And it's sort of, we have sort of left it there. Uh, as, a, as a core purpose, because uh, one of the key elements of that is to, a core purpose is something that you are not immediately going to attain and you maybe not, don't know how to do it. And this to us has been uh, a very, or to me at least, has been a good framework to capture uh, what's going on in EVE and what we sort of see in the trend overall. Because it's a bit of a leap of faith to, to wrap your head around that the computer game which many people just associate with this, how can a logical construct like that be more meaningful than life? And uh, I'm going to tell you a few stories, uh, mostly from Eve, to sort of create maybe a premise where you're willing to take the leap of faith with me. Um, over the years, we have had so many stories come out of Eve, and you can almost sort of pick out the sort of emotional words that people use to describe their experiences in Eve, and they become uh, these various sort of high emotion things. And it's like, why is a computer game, why is it so emotional? I, as the intro said, I'm an engineer uh, by training. And uh, I just thought I was making a 3D engine and a server thing. And it's like, where's all this emotion coming from? So I'm going to tell you like one story uh, about me. Uh, this is me in uh, circa September. 2003, uh, in my arms I have my newly born daughter, Eva, who is named after the game. That's how like, <laughs> ingrained this is in me. Uh, and there I am playing Eve Online. So Eve Online comes out in May 2003. Uh, Eva is born in September. And I took a, a little break from the craziness uh, that was the Eve Online development at the time uh, to sort of regroup with my family and uh, be there for uh, Eva and Gudrun, my wife. So uh, with that in mind, the first thing I do, of course, is go to play EVE Online. Because when you're on paternity leave, there's a lot of like the baby is sleeping, the mother is sleeping. You need to be there. But it's like, hmm, well, what's really my purpose? It's kind of just being there. OK, then I just can go and play a computer game. And I go and play EVE Online. Um, lo and behold, uh, it's not terribly entertaining. Uh, this learning cliff actually is there, even though you know everything about the game. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very odd experience when you just play EVE Online alone. And I, and I was just wondering, hmm, we need to work on this a lot. Uh, but why are people playing the game so much? And why are they liking it so much? Um, well, it must be because they are playing with each other. So i like, OK, how can I go and play the game? I mean, I'm the... I was at the time CTO of the company. I mean, I, I don't want to lie, so I have to have like a cover story. And like, became all very complicated. So I just said, ah, I'll just go and do it, and, and we'll figure it out. So I joined a, a little mining corporation. Uh, the corporation is uh, sort of the guild in Eve Online. It's a, it's a sort of base social construct that holds trust in the universe together. And this particular one uh, was mostly out of the UK. So I'm having a lot of sort of conversation with them where they're like, oh, where do you live? Oh, I live in Iceland. OK, uh, what do you do? Oh, I work in IT. Do you know the CCP guys? Yeah, it's a small country. Yeah, I know them a bit. And so I have sort of generality, so I, I feel like I'm, I'm not misrepresenting anything without giving anything away. So <clears throat> they're doing something interesting. They actually have a mission to get everyone in the company or the corporation into a partnership. So the progression of Eve Online, you start with a small ship and you want to own a battleship, then you want to take that battleship and destroy half a million dollars as happened last week. Um, and, uh, but they had 
used an exploit in the game where we had meticulously designed the game such that you had a very small cargo hold in your frigate. You had to go to the mining field, fill up the cargo hold, go back to the station, unload the mineral minerals, and do this again and again and again and again. And we had timed the mineral distribution to the station distribution, timed every aspect, the cargo hold sizes. We built like Excel sheet empires of content progression and all these things. It was meticulously designed. But when I saw what they did was, was basically circumvent all of that. They just ejected a cargo container into space, which was deeper code that we left in the game and had no gameplay purpose. And then they pulled their efforts into mining into the can and then had a, a, a hauler ship to go from the can and to the space station. So they were able to yield like 100 times the volume they should have been able to yield. And I was like, oh my god, the game is ruined. Calculating, OK, three weeks, they will have, all have a battleship. We're out of content. This will all burn out, and, and the whole premise of the game is ruined. Better go and plug that exploit. <laughs> um, but then I was, wait a minute, this is actually way more interesting than the game we designed, uh, the way they're doing this. Because they, I mean, they came up with this, so they like it a lot, because it's like an invention. Um, and it involves a lot of trust, because you have to trust the guy that's hauling. This is actually an open environment. Anybody can go and steal from it, or stealing is actually a, quite a sport in Eve Online. And I say, OK, how about if we just like, embrace this chaos, and we just uh, hope for the best? We'll figure out a way to fix the content problem later on. So I'm like, OK, I'm just in this corporation. I'm on my little frigate, going to mine like there's no tomorrow into this cargo container in hopes that uh, the corporation will pool resources, give me a cruiser, and then a bus ship. At one night, we're doing this. I'm kind of playing like I'm doing there with Eva in my arms and mining at the same time. And one of the guys uh, who are playing with me, he's logging off. He has a cruiser. And I say to him, well, if I borrow your cruiser, I can mine for the greater good with more impact than in my little frigate. And he says, OK, cool, that makes sense. So if you just follow me, um, we can swap the ships. So he needed to drop off some stuff. We fly to uh, some dark corner in the universe. We swap the ships. I need to now go back to the mining operation, put in an autopilot path, and then I go like, I go to the toilet and uh, do my business. I come back, and when I look at the screen, I see this. Uh, and this is the pot uh, in EVE, which basically it goes out of the ship when your ship is destroyed. And then you see the pot. And I look at it, it's just like, why is the pot there? And, and it's like, I've seen the pot. I mean, I used to use it when I was doing 3D engine tests. It's kind of a simple model. But it's like, when the pot is the pot, it represents something entirely different. And I'm like, OK, wait a minute. Damn it, I didn't check the autopilot path. I'm an idiot. So I must have gone through a low security system. I've been gate camped, and there's the pod of the ship I just borrowed from my friend. <laughs> oh my god, not have I only failed the basic hygiene test in the game I, I kind of participated in making, and I should know this. I've also betrayed the trust of my friend. Wait a minute, I'm the CTO. Uh, I can just uh, just type some commands into the server and make another ship. Whoa, why does that feel so wrong? <laughs> oh, now I'm disappointed in myself. <laughs> cheating in my own game. <laughs> but like, it's really cheating. Why, why, why does it feel so wrong? And then it was just, OK, if I make a spaceship like that out of nothing, where nothing got, no energy was dispensed into making a spaceship, then the spaceship isn't real. And if I bring something unreal into the game like this, the whole thing is going to crumble. I mean, OK, whether, whether or not I get away with it doesn't really know. I will always know the, the, the world isn't real. So and, and then I was just like, also just boiling with anger, like I was kind of wanting to take that monitor, you look at it, it's pre-flat screen era, I wanted to like throw it out the window, 
for all these things, and I'm standing there and kind of paralyzed. I'm having emotions I've never had. I've never had this sense of, like, betrayal of myself and this loss and this anger. And, like, why is the game doing this to me? It's just a, a little toy. But then I kind of, okay. So cheating in the game means creating something out of nothing. I must now uphold the law of the universe and now mine even more to mine back for the cruiser, return that back to my friend and uh, make good with that. And then mine even more to make good with the corporation for the time I lost by betraying their trust. So I sit for the rest of my paternity leave every waking hour, mining an EVE online. My wife, Gudrun, walks into me in the middle of the night, watches me and says, Hilmar, you've spent the last three years making this game. Now you sit here like a maniac playing it. You just had a baby. What is wrong with you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is a fundamental test from the universe. Can we create like reality out of this? And okay, that was sort of my story of Eve. And you could say, okay, sure, Hilmar, you can get emotional over this game and this pot and all that. But uh, does that really sort of extend on to others? And I, I think the, the sort of best example out of that is, is this. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of riots in EVE Online in 2011. Uh, at that point in time, we had done this. Uh, we had basically uh, released a very underwhelming uh, delivery of a promise, which was to bring uh, avatars into EVE Online. And we have added on top of it the ability to buy a monocle for 60 bucks. And the whole thing was very poorly thought through. It was poorly executed. It was an utter failure of us as a company to manage our own growth and even line and all that. And riots ensued. Of course, there were some like, nice things about it. It was kind of cool to have avatars. But it was so like, underwhelming to the user base. And it was kind of interesting to watch Occupy Wall Street at the same time. In reality, you had people sort of protesting against the failure of our governments to manage our economies and, and, and social justice and all those things. In EVE Online, we had similar riots where people were uh, protecting, uh, protesting against us as the sort of, in a way, the government of the game, even though we have a democratically elected council to also participate in this. And the amount of anger and emotion, thousands of people staying and protesting all this. We, of course, uh, thankfully recognized the error of our ways, did a lot of changes, and we sort of memorialized this uh, with, a, with a structure, which is the broken Tira statue, sort of as a reminder to ourselves to do a better job of, of managing uh, the game. Because ultimately, the game works on the premise that everyone accepts Again, the reality where, where all the objects in the game have come from somewhere, somewhere have, uh, someone has created it, there is some sort of emotional residue in every single object that enters into the universe. And when those things get destroyed, it's now uh, world news. So this is a story that was running uh, last week, where we had the biggest battle ever in the uh, history of EVE, where estimated $300,000 to half a million dollars got destroyed in about 20 hours uh, in this massive fight, and as was said in the intro, and everyone is very happy about it. They're so happy about it that uh, I actually brought this graph. This is the number of trials created every single day since 2004 in Evil Line. And you can see the spike when the story broke. Uh, twice the or even three times the biggest spike we've ever seen uh, joined the game as a result of a half a million dollars getting destroyed. And of course, engagement in the game and, and all of that is, is sort of off the charts. And uh, we again made a memorial to recognize that. Now you go into a massive Titan graveyard where uh, this took place in EVE. You can now log into the game and go and check this out. Um, and I'm going to try to explain a bit how that even though it's kind of impressive and it's got good sound bite that uh, half a million dollars got destroyed, it's something even more happened than just that. Just taking that alone is just looking at the tip of the iceberg 
of everything that sort of underpins a moment like this in Eve. And it's actually, we call that emergence. Uh, this is something we use in the vocabulary of, of explaining all this emergent activity where mining in a can, creating these massive fleet fights. This is all things we didn't design at all. We just created some sort of staple patterns that people are able to build upon. And I'm going to tell you another story. It's actually uh, about a different war, uh, because commenting on the current wars of EVE Online is a highly po political thing. I don't really want to mess it up and, and show any preference for any sites or misrepresent the facts, because there's a lot of misrepresentation that goes on. But this is the first thing that happened in EVE Online in terms of these massive, massive battles. So this is the galactic star chart of EVE Online. Every single dot here uh, is a solar system. So here in the center, um, it's actually safe to be. There is NPC police that sort of uh, keeps the peace in a way. So if you go and kill somebody there, then uh, the police interferes. It's actually somewhere here that I was mining in my little frigate to get a cruiser and, and get all, all that exploded. It kind of, while I was doing that, there was something else going on in the world, which I actually found out way after the fact. It's actually interesting with these things with Eve. They're kind of like wars in the real world. You have to piece together uh, the information, and the, the story is sort of written by the winners. In any way, uh, sort of in the beginning of 2003, this is the safe part. The premise of the game was people are going to migrate out of the safe part into the hostile areas of the game, which are occupied by computer-controlled pirates. That happened on the first minute. So uh, it was kind of interesting to see how in the beginning, we had a lot of sort of uh, people grouping, grouping together based on where they come from uh, the real world. So in the sort of initial state of Eve Online, then this area here was occupied mostly by Russian corporations and alliances, which are basically family of corporations. Over here, we had a lot of people from Scandinavia. Here, we had a lot of people from France, Germany, Benelux countries. And up here, we had the Americans. And it was very interesting to observe uh, that the Russians, uh, which are very good at playing game online, and uh, the game is oddly popular in Russia. Uh, it's something about like world domination, space, and <laughs> all this sort of real inconsequence, I think. Uh, I hope Paul Fesais appeals to them. Uh, and they were really good at playing the game, even to a point where they had hacked the game so they could speak in Russian font. Uh, we didn't support Unicode in the beginning. So um, if you had the Russian hack, you could basically communicate with no one. Because even if you spoke English, it was just like triangles and gibberish, unless you had the Russian mod. So their only uh, ways of communicating was violence. Um, <laughs> and uh, they actually uh, communicated a lot using that method with the, <laughs> with the, with the Scandinavians over here. And, um, it was interesting to observe, like the Russians, they had the numbers, they had the organization, they had the secret code language, but they weren't really able to push out the Scandinavians out of this region. Uh, and it wasn't really until the Russians figured out in a long counter espionage campaigns, campaign uh, that there were actually the Americans were secretly funding the Scandinavians. <laughs> So there was a massive line of ships going from like up north down to the south. All the while, the Americans were saying, we're just a peaceful manufacturing nation. Guns, guns don't kill people. People do. And it's like, we don't want this war business. Uh, and it wasn't really until the Russians figure all this out, they go and convince the friends to go and attack the Americans. And uh, then, disrupting the supply lines, the Russians were able to pass the Scandinavians out. And voila, this sort of massive drama plays out in, in, in three months. And then, I mean, at this point in time, there are about 50,000 people playing him online. So the biggest fleet fights were maybe uh, one tenth of what we're watching now. There are maybe $50,000 lost, not half a million dollars. But when you see these stories coming out of EVE Online, you can imagine behind every story like that, there is a massive drama that have taken, built up for months and months and months, and some massive plots and foiled plots and all that, which are behind it. And this all has turned us into talking about, okay, what happens in EVE is just as real 
as if it were to happen in the real world, from like an economy standpoint. Because if all the uh, items in the game have been produced by somebody that spent energy and time to make them, and then the game is constructed such that it can all go away, then we have sort of the basic principle of implementing what I call the Maslow of hierarchy of needs, or what is called the Maslow of hierarchy of needs. I obviously didn't invent this. Which is, okay, we have some needs. A lot of them have to do just with the physical layer in our reality. But everything above the physical layer of our reality is actually done in our minds. All the concepts that go above safety actually are things in our human brain. And we use the object of the real world to code these things. We code brands and identity and things like that into physical objects. And uh, I often use the example of what is it to own a Porsche and why would you want to own one? A Toyota costs you less, breaks down less, it has better resale value. If the point is to get from point A to B, this serves that utility. So why would you spend all that money on a Porsche? Well, it's obvious because you like the sound of the door, you have some various other ways to rationalize it. But I mean, ultimately, is that you want to be a person that does that versus doing this, and you want to communicate that to the world. And that is coating a lot of emotional things into the car, which has nothing to do with the physical utility of the car. I've often used another example of which I relate less to, which are uh, women's shoes. So why would you pay $500 for Manolo Blanix? I don't really get it. I mean, they look very uncomfortable. And uh, I mean, maybe just boots have a higher utility as a shoe. But then I've gone into, OK, there's a secret coating that goes on. Women look at each other's shoes. OK, Manolo Blanek, Jimmy Chu, Lebotin. And there's a, there's a multi-frequent signaling going on. We're completely <laughs> oblivious to this. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not wearing the shoes for us. We don't know uh, at all the difference in it. And again, it's coating uh, uh, something emotional into the physical reality. And if we accept the premise that we have created in EVE real objects through upholding the law of the universe of not creating something out of nothing, and that's why when you look at like what is to own a fake piece of Manolo Blanix, what does that really mean? Maybe it's a thing on its own. Own fakeness is a, is a, is a, is a way to communicate a certain emotion also. But if we accept that, then we can start to construct everything else on top of that. And then you can sort of actualize all the emotion uh, that we can have in reality in a computer game. And I hope some of the stories I've sort of relate sort of speak to that. Uh, this has actually been sort of written about uh, in some extent. There's a great book called The Experience Economy uh, by Joseph Pine where he talks about sort of progression of economic value. And you can actually map a lot of the pro progression of economic value onto the Maslow of hierarchy of needs. First, we have the physical objects. Uh, it's usually good to take coffee as an example. So I mean, coffee beans are the physical utility of a coffee. And in the 19, 1950s, you actually bought beans, you roasted them yourself, and you made coffee. Then, OK, we have something that's a product of coffee. We have ground coffee. You buy it, take it to your house, you have fun with it. We could almost map like console gaming into this paradigm. Like console gaming is something you go to a store, you buy a thing, then you play maybe with your friends. But the actual experience is like coffee. It's holding your own coffee party. The company is actually not participating or adding value to the activity after the fact. Then we have something coffee as a service. You go to a Dunkin' Donuts. And it's a coffee as a service. It's quick. It's consistent. There's a la large, massive counter. You can go in, and you can get dependable coffee service. Then you go into Starbucks, where it's actually been reversed. The massive counter is gone. And like all the space is spent on something else. And it's actually about staying in line and thinking about, OK, what kind of mocha, frappuccino things should I have? What defines me as a person? Oh, look at that girl over there. She's pretending to write a blog on her Mac. Oh, wait, is she checking me out? 
Oh, no, I'm getting coffee, yes. <laughs> And, and, and like the entirety of, of Starbucks is nothing about the coffee. If you, if you look at this economic progression, the actual amount of coffee sold in, in each step actually goes down. Uh, but the participation and the emotion goes up. And this is a little bit, okay, what can gaming in the golden age sort of be? I think it is going from sort of the bottom phases of, of this uh, progression and focusing on um, sort of the experience part, Char uh, sort of in the experience economy, they, they focus a lot on where the business model is, where you charge, or which I associate where does the company engage, and it's charging for feelings. And the highest order is to charge for the positive benefit that people get from being there. And uh, I have some stories about that, like where I have watched people that have played the online grow tremendously as people. Here is one of the most notorious person in Emeline, the Mitani. He's actually, he is, uh, he's very famous in Emeline. Like when we have our fan event, he, he has more interviews than I do because I mean, ultimately I'm just a janitor sort of cleaning up all the messes in Emeline. He is the man that currently holds the control of all the universe. And it's been very interesting to watch him grow as a person through this. And he has had an environment where you get to do something magical where you get to lead tens of thousands of people into battle, get to uphold these massive wars like we talked about, destroying millions of dollars and, and all that without really hurting, a, 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 a hurting anything or destroying anything for real. It all happens in this uppermost part of the hierarchy of needs. Here's another guy, he became famous for spending a year in in infiltrating a corporation, got written about, uh, in a great article in PC Gamer. And of course, I'm gonna just browse quickly through all this endless amount of sort of billions of stolen in an online robbery, giant space battles, and all these things. And all these stories from our co-creators and, and the people that have been with us on this journey is something that we are really sort of focusing on trying to capture, because there have been so many of them, and also capture stories where, again, to the progression of economic value, where we see that people have become stronger and they've grown for playing him online. Here's a guy uh, who actually has been written about. He has been transforming himself to look like his character in Eve. So he has gone from being this to being this. And he's actually, I've, I've seen, he's progressed this even further and is a true inspiration of, of, of how the game sort of as, uh, aspires you to be bigger than, than you are. Of course, I mean, at some point we had the idea, let's have like a Tattoos at FanFest, which is an event we hold in Iceland every single year, thousands of people come. And I thought maybe you have like one tattoo. There's actually usually a line and there are tens of tattoos and there are weddings and things that have happened at that event. We're now in the process of capturing these stories. This is actually a crowdsourcing website we've been doing. And again, when we analyze the stories, when we analyze the emotional words, we see a lot of this coming out. And, uh, and we're now in the process of taking all these stories from Emeline, creating sort of linear content so that people that don't want to go through the, through the full experience of playing EVE can sort of participate in EVE by reading about it in a comic and hopefully uh, sort of learning about it in a, in a television miniseries that we're about to put in place. But uh, I want to skip to this, which is really, is that EVE is hard. It has this massive learning curve. And again, uh, I've, we've been trying to analyze what is it that makes it so hard to accept the reality of EVE. And it's a little bit like I spoke in the beginning, to accept the fact that a spaceship is real, you need to take a bit of a leap of faith. You need to be a core gamer, kind of you've trained yourself to accept the reality of a computer game as a 2D thing on your screen. And there's something we're super excited about is this uh, platform innovation when it comes to virtual reality. Because I've seen when you put on your 3D glasses or your Oculus Rift, is that we've shortened the gap a lot to accept, okay, this is a real spaceship, I'm actually in it and it's reality. And it's my true hope that gaming in the golden age is going to involve a lot of things like Eve Online that are much more easier for people to accept as reality 
because when we communicate through the dimension of just having it on your face and you see reality as you experience it, it's a much shorter leap of faith to really sort of accept that we really have the ability to create virtual worlds more meaningful than real life. Thank you.